thank you guys so much for joining us this morning, this workshop, um, Nutrition, Health, and Wellness. So really appreciate Lee Lukemeyer from our OU Tulsa campus um, joining us and sharing some great information. Um, she's located at the School of Community Medicine up there. So really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, as Lindsay said, my name is Lee Luke-Demeyer. I am an assistant professor and the director of preclinical education for the OU School of Community Medicine Physician Assistant Program here in Tulsa. And I also serve as a nutrition outreach fellow for the PA Foundation. And I'm excited to speak with you all today as a part of the Live Well program. I myself participate in it and I need to get it, make sure I get everything logged before the end of the month, before that next quarter rolls over. But today we're going to be talking about nutrition and wellness in the setting of healthy aging. We will also discuss the importance of nutrition in the setting of two conditions we commonly see in medicine, which are diabetes and wound healing. Wound healing. So first, let's talk about healthy aging throughout the lifespan. When we talk about adulthood, we like to break lifespans into three categories. So we have young adulthood, which this is the ages of 18 to 35, Often this is when, pe when people are in their peak physical health. During this time, people should be focusing, focusing on solidifying healthy lifestyle habits. And as a healthcare provider, often I'm focusing on disease prevention for my patients. So it's important for people in this age group to minimize alcohol consumption, reinforce healthy dietary patterns, and focus on either enforcing or establishing routine healthy exercise patterns. Middle adulthood is those ages of 35 to 65. And during this time period, we often can see chronic disease develop. And the focus, my focus as a healthcare provider is to prevent disease that from developing during this time period. But if disease is present, we also want to treat it and minimize progression of disease. We also continue to focus on primary disease prevention. It's important to focus on healthy dietary and exercise patterns as well. The final category is older adulthood, which is based on the age of 65 and up. At, during this time frame, healthy and dietary and exercise patterns are important for the prevention of the complications of diseases that may already be in place, but also to promote maximal functioning. Okay, so across our lifespan, the goal is we want to maintain and focus on healthy nutrition. So what can happen when we have poor nutrition? The impact of poor nutrition is magnified as we age. In young adulthood and middle adulthood, poor nutrition can lead to the development of chronic diseases. A few examples of this would be obesity, diabetes, hypertension, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, gastroesophageal reflux, just to name the few, a few common chronic diseases we can see develop during this time period. Poor nutrition during young adulthood, young and middle adulthood also leads to changes in physical capacity. In older adulthood, the, this change in physical capacity contributes further to cr chronic disease development, immobility, and ultimately cognitive decline. And I think we could all probably agree we would like to avoid these things, right? We all want, if we were all asked, I think we would all want to say we want to maximize our health and age gracefully and in a healthy manner. So what are some of the risk factors associated with the risk factors that can contribute to poor nutrition? Well, there's a variety of socioeconomic factors. Pa people have limited budgets. Social isolation can come into play. People have a lack of social support or family support. There may be coexisting conditions that contribute to nutritional status. Another thing that I deal with on a weekly basis in clinic is access to food for my patients. Do they have access to food? Do they have the funds to, to get the healthy nutrition that they need? Can they physically get to the grocery store? And can patients prepare foods? Those are all questions and concerns that need to be addressed. So first let's look at aging in the United States. Um, we are an aging society, as you can see here, the number of people age 65 or older by 2040 is expected to be 80.8 million people, and people are living longer. It's important to note that if people reach the age of 65, the likelihood is they will like, the likelihood is they can probably live another 19 years. And this sounds great. 
Um, but in reality, compared to other developed nations, the life expectancy is less than other countries. So many most common health conditions in older adults, uh, older adults you can see listed here on the screen, hypertension, arthritis, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, common conditions we see, I see in clinic every week. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes are the top 10 leading causes of death in our state. So they're very prevalent. Um, you yourself may have one of these conditions, or you may know a friend or a loved one that's, that has one of these conditions. So very prevalent we see in both our local environment and our country. As we look at aging, it's also important to know that over the last, over 100 years, um, health concerns have looked different. Over 100 years ago, we were concerned more with infectious disease and nutritional de deficiencies were common. Now in the United States, we have problems with excess and this contributes to the development of chronic disease and aging in the United States. So let's talk about healthy and unhealthy aging. Everybody ages, everybody gets older, but not at the same pace. I think we all probably know of people who look or act 20 years younger or older than they, act, they actually are. We know genetics, health conditions, and lifestyle impact our appearances and our general well-being and health. So I think this picture is pretty interesting. This was a study done, I think in the early 2000s, it was a twin study. And the, these are twins, Jean and Susan, and they were 61 at the time. If you asked Jean, she would have said that she looks 10 years older than her sister Susan on the right. Um, researchers, I'm not sure what criteria or how they determined this, but they actually upped that to 11 and a quarter years. So they said that Jean looked younger, 11 over 11 years younger than her sister. Well, it's important to note that lifestyle factors impact our aging. We're looking at physical appearance here, but it impacts our overall health. So Susan smoked for 16 years of her life. She sunbathes and she weighs 15 pound le pounds less than her sister, G. And we can definitely see that in, the, in their picture. She has more skin discoloration due to UV exposure. We know that um, smoking also decreases um, or increases the development of wrinkles. And with aging in UV light, we can see reduction in skin elasticity and wrinkle development. Okay, so let's define healthy aging. The World Health Organization defines healthy aging as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well being in older age. Well, so what does that look like? It's going to be different for every person. And it can include meeting our basic needs. Some people may, may um, want to make, maintain autonomy. Mobility may be a big concern for some people. Relationships may be the most important factor in aging successfully. Societal contributions affect us all. So I want you to think, how do you define healthy aging? What elements are important to you? And it's these are all important topics that will be individualized for each person. And they're things that I discuss with my patients when we discuss goals of care. So now let's talk about unhealthy aging. As you can see here, unhealthy aging is associated with dementia, impaired mobility, chronic disease, societal disconnection, mood disorders, malnutrition, and difficulty performing everyday activity. These are all elements of aging that concern us. But you'll be glad to know that we can do some things to prevent or slow many of these concerns. So let's look at the effect that aging has on our body. As you can see here, it's broken down by different organ system. Um, and these are the potential health concerns that can happen as we age. Well, with proper nutrition, we can sometimes prevent disease, but we can also impact disease that may already be in place and they can not, and proper nutrition can make us feel better, but also help us age a little bit more gracefully. So let's talk about the role of nutrition. Um, it plays life, uh, ro ro nutrition plays a role in life sustaining nutrients. Um, it's important throughout our lifespan across the birth to death. Nutrition can prevent and treat chronic diseases. We find enjoyment with eating. Lots of social events are related to our nutrition intake. Um, it can improve our quality of life and ultimately help us maintain our functional status. So what nutrients are, are we concerned with? Well, we need more dark greens and orange vegetables, whole grains, 
dairy, calcium, vitamin B12, vitamin D, riboflavin, thiamine, magnesium. These are all important nutrients that we need on a daily basis. We need less sodium, saturated fat, sugar, and alcohol. Okay, those are all things we need less of. So how do we incorporate these recommendations? Well, in our daily diet, we should be focusing on trying to increase whole grains, eat monosaturated fats, focus on lean proteins, more fiber, fruits, and vegetables. At the same time, we need to limit processed foods, added sugars, white breads and grains, limit our sodium, alcohol intake, saturated and trans fatty acids. So that's a lot of information. I know healthy eating in a busy world is hard. Um, I struggle with it just as much as anyone else to make sure that my family and myself are eating healthy. Um, typically when we're talking about healthy eating, it's easy to pick two of the three. It's hard to find foods that meet all three of these requirements. So we can get cheap and fast food and fast food. We know that that is not healthy. Um, healthy and convenient food oftentimes comes at a higher price tag. Cheap and healthy sometimes requires time and preparation, but we can find sources that meet all three of these needs of cheap, healthy, and fast. And examples of a cheap and healthy protein source would be beans, tofu, um, an example of something that meets all three of these, these areas of healthy eating. In my house, um, veggie bowls are kind of a staple dinner we have, it seems like almost weekly. Um, and the format varies from week to week based on what we have available, but it often involves a whole grain. Um, it could be brown rice, quinoa, or farro, and then a variety of roasted vegetables, maybe a lean protein, some nuts, and a little bit of a sauce. Last week, I think I made brown rice veggie bowls. Um, with roasted sweet potato, avocado feta, some kale chips, some pistachios, and a little bit of tzatziki sauce. Um, and it was pretty easy to make and expensive. And my kids like it because they have autonomy. They have to try everything, but they get to pick out what, what they want to add to their plates as far as quantity, as long as they try everything. So this is a work in progress. I myself um, work on this on a, on a daily basis as well and struggle with this as anyone does. But over time, it's easy to implement small changes. When we talk about um, preparing healthy foods, some kind of meal recommendations that are helpful or what I call the four S's. So soups and stews, scrambles, salads, and sheet pans are four easy dinners that can be relatively cheap and convenient and healthy and to make. And oftentimes um, in my house, I'll make enough so we have leftovers for lunch later on in the week or, or dinner. So soups and stews are an easy way to incorporate whole grains, vegetables, and lean meats. Scrambles, this can involve um, egg scrambles for those people who eat eggs and incorporating veggies into it. I like to oftentimes incorporate um, sauteed spinach into my um, scrambles or make and make for my kids green eggs. Um, if people don't eat eggs, tofu scrambles are another e easy meal option. Salads, there's a variety of things you can do with salads as far as incorporating, you can add whole grains, you can add vegetables, lean protein, um, and it kind of gets, and it makes it fun to kind of experiment and try different things. As far as sheet pan suppers, it can involve obviously taking a sheet pan and roasting my vegetables with my lean protein um, and can usually get that out in about 30 minutes. So this takes time, but absolutely there are ways that we can find healthy, cheap, and convenient food. All right, so let's talk about successful weight management. We know nutrition and well-being oftentimes are correlated with weight. Um, as far as successful weight management, we know that if people track the weight that they're losing, over time, they're going to be more successful. So patients um, weigh themselves in this study, it was once a week, they watch less screen time and they exercise. And we know that these are all factors associated with successful weight management. One of the things I can counsel my patients often on is a setting SMART goals. And SMART goals stand for specific, measurable, achievable, and relevant and time bound. So we don't want to set a goal that I just want to lose 50 pounds. We want to set a specific goal of, and a time frame associated with it. 
weight management is one of those things that is frustrating um, for all for a lot of people. And I remind my patients that weight loss is a marathon, not a sprint. No, they don't have to run a marathon, but we're looking at the big picture and longevity over time. Um, small changes over time that are sustainable will result in health benefits. Okay, so let's move on to some types of nutrients really quickly. What is a carbohydrate? Um, carbohydrates provide our body with glucose, which is then converted into energy and supports bodily functions and physical activity. As you can see here listed on the screen, we can see carbohydrates in dairy products, fruits, grains, vegetables. Um, we can also see it in the form of sugars. So not all carbohydrates are created equal. We want to make sure that we are selecting the healthiest source of carbohydrates. And so this is going to be minimally processed grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans are examples of that. Whereas unhealthy sources of carb carbs includes white breads, pastries, sodas, anything that's highly processed. Okay. So over time, making the choice towards more of a unrefined carbohydrate has better health benefits. Okay. Let's also talk about fiber. Fiber is an important component um, in our diet. As Americans, we don't get enough fiber in our diet. The average American takes in about 10 to 15 grams of fiber daily, whereas you can see here, the Institute of Medicine recommends 21 grams for those under the age of 51, 25 if you're over 51, and the requirements are higher for men as well. We know that fiber can reduce our LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. It can make us feel full. It can help regulate our bowel movements, improve glucose control, help with weight loss, and high fiber diets have been correlated with an increased life expectancy. Okay, so when we're talking about nutrients, it is important that we start to read food labels, and this can kind of be overwhelming and confusing for people. This is just kind of an example of a food label. As you can see here, it lists the number of servings per container, the number of servings, what the serving size looks like. This is important because I encourage you at some point to look at this and then actually maybe get out a measuring cup because oftentimes our perception of what the serving size is, is different than what we think it is. Our nutritional labels give us a total calorie count and this is important. It also gives us a breakdown of different nutrients that we find in food. The big components I like to tell patients to, to take a look at is, we absolutely want to look at our, our total sugars, fiber, and protein in account of the foods. All of this is important. Yes, absolutely. But we'll look at some labels next. But the total sugar, protein, and fiber are big components to look at. So let's look at some labels. So if we look at these three labels here, and I'll tell you what these are in just a few minutes, the label on the left, we see it has the lowest amount of calories in it. It has a pretty significant amount of sugar in it, a little bit of protein I see in there, um, but it's the lowest calorie option and it has two grams of fiber. We move on to the next label and we see that this of these options, it has the most calories in it. It also has the most sugar in it. It does have more protein than our first option and it does have a little bit more fiber, three grams versus the two grams in our first label. Let's move on to our last label, which is on the right. We see that this, the total calorie count is 210, but this option has the most fiber in it, the least amount of sugar and the most amount of protein. So I want you to take just a second and I want you to make a mental note of what you think is the healthiest option. Okay, now let me tell you what they are. The first is Lucky Charms, which I think we can all agree is not healthy. Um, my kids might try to tell you otherwise, but it's not healthy. Um, so this is where looking at the total calories doesn't give us the whole picture, right? We move on to the second option. This is Smart Start. Um, it has more calories and more sugar in it compared to the Lucky Charms. Our final label is Kashi Go Lean. And I would argue that this is the best cereal choice of the choices we have up here because it has the most fiber, the least amount of sugar, and the most amount of protein. And that's important when we're talking about cereal is we want to make sure we're limiting the sugar intake and looking for something that's high in fiber and protein. All right, let's talk about the plate method. So 
As far as when we approach a meal, this is kind of a good method to kind of keep in mind. A quarter of our plate should include lean protein, a quarter include grains and vegetables, and the other half should be, have fruits and vegetables. I tell my kids every day, fill half your plates with fruits and vegetables. And this is a great, a great approach. Now there's different guidelines we could give you about actual quantities, um, but sometimes we can get caught up in all of those numbers. So if we use the plate method, it gives us a way to kind of eyeball, eyeball what we're eating from day to day. And it's very attainable to do. Okay. All right, let's move on and talk about exercise. We know exercise not only improves our well physical well-being, but it also helps either limit disease development and it helps us feel better overall. We see increase in lean body mass. Patients can develop increase in bone density, which is important as we age, because as we age, we lose bone density. It can improve our glucose tolerance, which is important. We'll talk about diabetes in a few minutes, um, but it will help improve sugar tolerance. Exercise can help regulate bowel movements. It can improve mobility. We see improved cognitive function associated with exercise. And overall, you, a person just feels better um, with exercise. So the picture you see here, I think is gr a great example of how when it's, ne it's never too late to start incorporating exercise into your um, daily activities. This is Ernestine Shepherd, and she didn't start training or working out really until she was in her 50s. She saw her primary care provider and had was taking different medications for chronic diseases and decided that she was ready to, to do something about this. Um, and so she started exercising. And recently she was de declared the oldest competitive female bodybuilder. So it's a great example of we should of the importance of exercise and it's never too late to start. Okay, so exercise is important. How what how much do we need to exercise? So the recommendations are for 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity every week. So what does that mean? Well, aerobic activity is what we refer to as cardio. And basically, this is an activity that gets you breathing harder and your heart beating faster, okay? And intensity is how hard your body is working during that time. So when we talk about moderate intensity exercise, what we're talking about is an activity that gets you working hard enough to raise your heart rate. You may break a sweat. Um, one of the ways to tell if it's a moderate intensity activity, aerobic activity, is that you're still able to talk, but maybe if you're listening to music, you can't sing the words of your favorite song, okay? Common examples of moderate intensity aerobic exercise include walking fast, water aerobics, um, maybe riding a bike on a level ground, pushing a lawnmower are all examples. When we talk about vigorous aerobic activity, this means that you're breathing hard and fast and your heart rate has gone up quite a bit. And one way that you can determine whether you're exercising vigorously versus moderately is with vigorous intensity exercise, you can kind of implement the talk test to gauge your intensity. And what that means is that you're being active, but you aren't able to say more than a few words without pausing to catch your breath. Okay, so that when when that is present, then you know that you are um, participating in vigorous intensity exercise. Well, so we know aerobic exercise is important. So is strength training. Recommendations are to have at least two days of strength training per week. This is important because we know that strength training um, helps with balance training. It also helps us build bone health as well. So also something that we need to incorporate. So the key is to do something. Some physical activity is better than nothing. People can start by doing small amounts of physical activity and gradually increase frequency and intensity over time. Um, I talk with my patients about exercise all the time. And for some of my patients, if I say you need to start working out aerobic exercise 150 minutes a week, that can be really daunting. It's hard for someone who has not incorporated exercise to get to that immediately. So oftentimes we start at smaller goals. You know, I have one patient who we started with, she walks in her neighborhood for 10 minutes, three times a week. And it took a while to get to where she could maintain that. And then we built, built from there. So the key is doing something is better than nothing and we can build upon things. And this is our ultimate goal. 
All right. So next, let's talk about nutrition and wounds. We've talked about healthy aging and the importance of nutrition and exercise. Let's touch on two common conditions in medicine we see that are greatly impacted by nutrition. We'll quickly touch on wounds and diabetes. First, we'll talk about wounds. Um, where, so where do we see wounds in a medical setting? We can see wounds develop as a result of surgery. Infection can cause wounds. It could, wounds could be a sequela of chronic disease, such as diabetes or vascular disease. Um, patients with limited mobility can develop wounds as a result of pressure injuries. So they're very prevalent in medicine. So quickly, let's look at an overview. A wound is an injury to skin or body. And when your body is healing a wound, it goes through multiple steps and your immune system is activated to respond, to start rebuilding the wound and to continue to strengthen the wound after it has started healing. Each step of the process, and we won't get into the specifics so the specifics of wound um, formation and healing, but it requires important nutrients to function properly. And without those nutrients, we can have delayed healing over time. So what are some risk factors for developing wounds? Um, they include getting unable to get out of bed, aging in general, um, increases our risks for wounds. As we age, our skin gets thinner. Diseases, diabetes and blood vessel disease are common disorders that um, increase risk for wound development. If somebody has impaired, impaired sensation, they may not feel the development of a wound on their extremity. And poor nutrition on its own is a risk factor. So it's important to be able to manage these factors in order to help our bodies heal. Okay, now let's talk there about specific uh, nutrients in wound healing. As you can see here, there's a whole list of nutrients that are that are play a role in wound healing. We need calories and protein to preserve and build body mass. Collagen is important because it's one of the proteins that is important for internal structure of our skin. Fluids are important so that we can have normal cellular function and circulation and oxygenation of tissue. We need vitamin B12. It's involved in immune function and helps with wound healing. Vitamin C is important for connective tissue formation. Vitamin E is an antioxidant and it helps cell membrane stabilization, which is important for healing. We know that zinc also promotes healthy tissue. And some other amino acids, arginine and glutamine, which you see listed here, are important for protein synthesis. And hydroxymethylbutyrate, or HMB, is important for the maintenance of lean body mass. So it's important to note calories provide energy so your body can use protein to repair wounds. Protein is made up of vital building blocks called amino acids that your body will use for rebuilding wounds. And so what we'll do now is we'll talk about a little bit more about different specific nutrients. Um, proteins are an important source of um, amino acid building. And so we need to eat a variety of high quality proteins to ensure that we have a variety of amino acids being built. This is important absolutely when we have wound healing and also general in a, in, an, in a diet. And there's a variety of sources of proteins available. You can see them listed there and it should, meet the dietary needs of all individuals. So if somebody adheres to a plant-based diet, maybe we would encourage them to eat more tofu, lentils, or maybe pumpkin seeds are a great source of protein. If somebody is vegetarian, we could encourage eggs and yogurt or, or other dairy sources as well. And then if so, and for those who eat meat, we wanna encourage lean meats, which you can see listed there, um, fish, chicken, or all lean sources. When we talk about amounts of protein, it can be kind of confusing. So this kind of gives you a breakdown. We have proteins in a variety of food sources. Um, and so as you can see here, the breakdown based on vegetables, um, grains, um, dairy, and meat as well. So it, it's good to give you general um, requirements. We won't go into the specifics of how much protein someone needs because that's very much can be individualized. But in the setting of wounds, patients do need an increased protein in their diet to uh, facilitate healing. When we talk about fluids, it's important to have the right types of fluids to ensure wounds can heal properly. 
We want to replace any fluids that may be lost. Water absolutely is vital. Um, we want to limit any type of sugary beverages um, because those are just refined sugars and carbohydrates that are not healthy for us and do not promote um, any healing. When we talk about vitamin C, it's important, as I mentioned, for connective tissue and healing. And as you can see here, there's a ton of sources of vitamin C. I think historically we think of oranges as having a lot of vitamin C, um, and they do. But as you can see here, there's other sources um, that have just as much, if not more. Bell peppers are a common source of vitamin C. We can find it in kale, tomato, broccoli. So it's important to eat a variety of different um things in our diet, and we can get a variety of nutrients we need. So zinc, also important player in wound healing. As you can see here, we get zinc in a variety of ways. Um, mushrooms, oatmeal are common sources of zinc. We can see it in um, seafood as well. When a patient or person is not able to meet all of the nutrients they need, and then it's important for them to talk to a dietitian or their healthcare provider about supplementation because there are a variety of supplements um, that will provide nutrient deficits that the patient cannot get in their diet. Ultimately, from a dietary standpoint, the best sources are those that they take in, in um, whole unprocessed foods, but if that is not achievable, then it's important to talk with your healthcare provider or dietitian about nutritional supplements. Okay. Now let's talk about diabetes and prediabetes. We see diabetes is prevalent in the United States and in the state of Oklahoma. You may have diabetes or you may know a friend or a loved one who has diabetes. So what exactly is diabetes? Diabetes is an impaired ability to utilize glucose either from insulin resistance, decreased insulin insulin production, or a combination of the two. And prediabetes is just a milder form of impairment that has not reached the, reached the level of diagnosis to diabetes. And we'll define the di how we diagnose it in just a minute. Um, this is the data you can see on the screen from 2018. I suspect it has increased, um, but it's important to know diabetes is very prevalent in our society. One in four patients over the age of 65 has been diagnosed with diabetes. And so it's important to recognize um, diabetes and treat it um, as soon as we can, because ultimately it will improve patients' um, outcomes and morbidity and mortality. Okay, so how do we diagnose diabetes? You may have heard of a hemoglobin A1C. This is a blood test that we look at, and it looks at your average sugar readings and gives us a percentage and to be diagnosed with diabetes, a patient has to have an A1C of greater than or equal to 6.5, or we can check a fasting glucose. And so that would be a sugar level from a blood drawing of greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. And those who are in the pre-diabetes range, you guys can see those numbers listed there. They haven't developed diabetes yet, but are definitely at risk and it needs to be managed. Okay, so what are some of our risk factors for prediabetes or diabetes? We can see age. As we get older, um, our risk increases, and this has to do with insulin changes that can happen with aging. Patients who have polycystic ovarian syndrome are at an increased risk of developing diabetes. Women who have had gestational diabetes or have given birth to a baby greater than nine pounds have an increased risk of developing diabetes. Family history increases your rate. Um, patient, people who have decreased physical activity levels are at increased growth, risk. Obesity, obesity and being overweight increase your risk for developing diabetes. Smoking and sleep apnea are also additional risk factors. Okay, so how do we prevent and manage um, type 2 diabetes? Well, so one of the things we can do is weight loss. Weight loss is an important, not only for the prevention, but also in the management of diabetes. And it doesn't have to be significant amounts of weight. Small amounts of weight loss, anywhere from five to 7%, we start, we start to see improvement in people's sugar levels. So for a, 200, a patient who weighs 200 pounds, 5% weight loss of, would be 10 pounds. So losing 10 pounds, we would see health benefits associated with that. We know that incorporating physical activity also helps with our glycemic control. Dietary modifications are important. The, the nutritional 
um, discussion we had earlier um, this afternoon absolutely can come into play. If patients smoke, they should stop. If they have sleep apnea, it needs to be treated. With diabetes, there are medications that we can treat use. Um, and for some patients, they may be candidates for weight loss surgery as well. So these are all important discussions for people to have with their healthcare provider. So why do we care about diabetes besides it's a chronic condition? A lot of patients may not feel bad when they're diagnosed. And so sometimes it can be hard for, for my patients to understand why it's important for me to treat them and to get their, their glycemic control better and diabetes controlled better. Well, ultimately, over time, diabetes causes what we call end organ damage. And so we want to treat diabetes to prevent these complications from developing. So it's important for people to know that diabetes can damage your eyes, your nerve endings. It can cause kidney damage. Um, it increases patients' risk for heart attack and stroke and ultimately impairs their immune system. So Ultimately, we want to prevent this all from happening, and so it's important to address um, diabetes and treat it appropriately. And this can be done a variety of measures from lifestyle measures of, of incorporating diet and exercise and with the addition of medications as well. And so these are important conversations for people to have as they discuss this with your their healthcare providers. And I think we'd all agree that these are all health concerns that we want to avoid or we want our loved ones to avoid. And it's it's important for those to for everyone to know that it is preventable or we absolutely can treat it. So that ends the presentation today. I'd be happy to take any questions anyone may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Lee. There has uh, have been just a few that have dropped in the okay. Chat. Let me um, see. You covered, you know, your four S's with the soups and stews and scrambles and all of that. So, uh, Bria asked if you have a recipe book um, that you're able to share, or maybe oh, anything so you can suggest. Um, let me. Uh, yes, I have a variety. I love to cook, um, and there's a variety of cookbooks I could recommend to you. I will make a plug for OU Tulsa. We have a a lifestyle medicine program that we've incorporated for our students, both PA students and medical students. And let me check. Um, there are recipes that we use um, with our students that they actually get to go in the kitchen and learn how to cook. And let me check to see if I would be if it's something that I could share with you all because um, it's a it's a great resource and I've had fun making those those things. Um, when you're looking at cookbooks and diets, um, we know that a Mediterranean diet is kind of a good diet to follow. I mean, I hate to word the word diet, but a good um, lifestyle to follow it as well as choices. So I would look for cookbooks um, that are Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet is a good diet for hypertension and diabetes as well. There's a slew of things out there. Excellent. Yeah. And can help make sure that those are also included in that follow-up email. Yeah. Uh, and then also uh, you get some that are also interested in healthy weight gain. So do you have any suggestions, um, kind of rules of thumb for those interested in healthy weight gain? Yeah, and that's important because you're right. Some of our patients do, or I, I, I default to patients, I'm sorry, people absolutely need, need to gain weight and that, and we want to do it in a healthy manner, right? We don't, we hear about actors who have to put on like 30 pounds and then they just like binge on ice cream and all sorts of crazy foods. That's not healthy. Um, I would say that increasing protein intake is important. So finding those lean protein. Um, also in that setting, if you're not able to achieve your goals um, with diet alone, it would be worth talking to your provider about maybe incorporating some nutritional supplements. Um, the next time you're at CVS, Walgreens, Target, Walmart, just walk down the aisle. You'll see there's all types of supplements. New, uh, I know I'm not endorsing anyone at all, but boost, ensure, rejuven, all sorts of things that are high in protein. Um, and so, some have varying degrees of sugar that can help as well. Fantastic. Thank you. And then um, how do you deal with sugar cravings? So yes, we, it's good to be mindful of added sugars, but man, that can be such a struggle for so many of us. How do you how do you deal with those sugar cravings? Um, I wish I had a good answer. I don't. And I have to tell you all, I'm the troop leader for my daughter's Girl Scout troops and in charge of cookie sales. So I have probably like 50 boxes of Girl Scout cookies in my house right now. Um, so I don't 
I, I mean, that's, that's tough. I think it's one of those things that over time it's, you want to incorporate less and less sugar, but we also know that over to be able to maintain that having some sugar is okay. Okay. I think anytime we talk about diets and someone goes from one extreme to the other, that's not sustainable. So as far as sugar cravings, maybe instead of going for the candy bar, maybe you get the chocolate covered almonds. So you're getting some protein with almonds, um, but you're still also getting some sugar or maybe a dried fruit instead is a better sugar source than um, something processed. So you're telling me that chocolate covered strawberries are a great choice. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And Trader Joe's makes a great frozen one if you haven't seen this. Wonderful, wonderful. I will make sure I, I note that. <laughs> and then um, it was great that you went over the um, food labels, nutrition labels, and kind of deciphering between those. Um, and someone also mentioned about, you know, do you factor in the serving size too? Because I saw with those three examples of those cereals, the serving sizes could be a little bit different too. So that's something we need to be mindful of too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's it's important because if we look, I mean, a lot of it's determined too by the size of our plates or our bowls. So we know that if people have larger plates, they're going to eat more um, just based on the visuals of the plate and wanting to fill their plate. So there have been studies that show that. Um, but absolutely, I encourage you if you haven't done it before to actually measure out what the serving is and you will see that it is usually less than what you think it is. Fantastic. Melissa dropped in there. You know, she really appreciates this information. It's helping her understand better for raising her new one-year-old. Um, now on solid foods, can make better decisions on navigating through all of that. Um, I know I have a son that's almost four. Uh, and so I try to be careful, you know, in helping him and talking about, you know, oh, this is a treat, not really talking about good foods or bad foods, but oh, this is a treat. So it's something that we can have sometimes. And then, you know, identifying, trying to help identify foods that are, um, you know, good foods that help you um, with being strong and growing and energy and all of that good stuff. So um, I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly with certain fruits and vegetables. Uh, Kaylee has shared with me some of her um, ways of navigating through that with um, how she does it with her little kiddos. So I'm sure any of us that have kiddos that you have extra nuggets of knowledge <laughs> for, for those is helpful. I wish I could tell you I have it all down. I don't. So I have 11 year old twins um, who really are pretty good eaters. And then a nine year old daughter who is a little bit more picky and we sometimes butt heads over what we need to try. Um, and really, I think the key is to just continue to provide options. One of the things I always say is that we need to try new things because our taste buds change and we need to eat the rainbow. And I don't know if it's sticking, but I hope so. I do know the other day, my daughter said she was hungry for a snack and she said, can I have some of those cut up bell peppers in the fridge? I was like, absolutely eat the whole thing, do whatever you want. And I hadn't even mentioned that as an option. So just be patient with yourself too, um, and just continue to offer them is my only advice. Fantastic. I, I really appreciate that, um, you know, you incorporated those different lifestyles with um, how nutrition and um, physical activity alongside with working with your healthcare provider can really make an impact that it's not always all about medication. And if you get a diagnosis um, that you're not just you know, set on that for the rest of your life, that they're, you know, working with your healthcare provider, that there are some healthy lifestyle things that you can do. So I really appreciate that you shared those with us today. Um, if you anybody else has a question in the chat, I know we've had a few comments, they're fantastic. We will make sure to include lead contact information. So if there's anything else, um, you know, that comes to mind when I send that follow-up email, uh, Lee has been gracious enough to be able to um, be open to answering any of those questions. Well, fantastic. We'll kind of just hang out for a little bit longer. Again, Lee, thank you so yeah. much. Um, really appreciate your time and great knowledge that you've had to share with us today. And everyone that joined us, again, 
another last reminder, look out for that follow-up email and hope you can join us for um, our additional upcoming workshops. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed speaking with everyone. And yes, feel free to email me if you guys have any questions after the fact. It's, it's, I've enjoyed talking with you all today.